In the last video, we were exploring this idea of the tragedy of the commons. And now we want to explore the questions if the tragedy of the commons and other social dilemmas can at all be overcome, be solved, and if so, how? Because this is a very central question in uh, to understand and address sustainable development challenges. So to answer this, let's first look at a look at a little bit at the history of the idea of the tragedy of the commons. So the ecologist Garrett Hardin was the one that popularized the tragedy of the commons in an article in 1968, where he used the example of a village pasture that gets overused because people individually want to put more and more cows on the pasture and then it just gets over overused. So what was what were Hardin's ideas about how to solve this tragedy of the commons? Well, Hardin, Hardin thought that we can't really rely on the conscience or moral sentiments of individuals or social motivations because these individuals would sooner or later be exploited and cheated by more selfish individuals. And these selfish individuals would always be at an advantage, therefore also considered basically more rational. So using more and more resources uh, is just would be considered the more rational thing to do anyway. And so he thought, therefore, the only solutions would be two ideas. First, top-down regulation and coercion. We basically need some state, somebody that forces people to behave in a certain way. He even said things like, freedom in the commons brings ruin to all. So if we just allow people to behave as they choose, this ultimately will lead to the tragedy of the commons, which brings ruin to all. And so we need to find a way to restrict people's freedom through some sort of coercion. But he did note that these rules would have to be agreed on by all. He was talking about mutually agreed upon coercion. The other idea he had was privatization. So we need to simply privatize the resources rather than one group of people using a shared resource. Everybody should just have their own private resource because in this way, we don't really have to solve a social dilemma in the first place because we don't have a social interaction. Everybody's behavior really only just has outcomes for themselves, for their own resource. And he said things like, yes, private property plus inheritance can be unjust, but injustice, again, is preferable to total ruin. So think about a little bit, what do you think about Harbin's ideas? Are these the only solutions to the tragedy of the commons? Why do you think so or, or why not? Or what could also be some problems with these um, recommended solutions? You can stop the video maybe for a minute to think about some ideas. Well, let's think about top-down regulation. This can be problematic because, well, first of all, who are the ones who are actually deciding the rules and who will be enforcing the rules? In fact, making and enforcing rules itself takes time and resources and some commitment. So in fact, it is just another cooperation problem. So we just end up, instead of solving the tragedy of the commons, we just replace it with yet another cooperation problem because we have to find people who are committed to actually decide on rules and to enforce those rules. So that's one challenge. Another challenge is that history tells us that humans can't be forever forced to obey rules that they don't agree with. Uh, there are revolutions, wars, strikes, and so on. So it is just something that... Well, first of all, is it actually a society we, that we want to live in? And really, humans don't want to often live in societies like this. Sooner or later, they will uh, revolt. And generally, under such conditions, enforcement can, of rules can just become too expensive or violent or really just impossible, especially the bigger the group and the more dynamic the resource, so it just gets really more and more difficult to monitor everybody's behavior. And also, the less people have agreed with the rules, the more they're willing to, to break those rules, and it just can become really impossible. So that's one set of challenges with this idea of just solving the tragedy with top-down regulation and enforcement. What about the idea of privatization? 
Well, that can also be problematic because, first of all, many resources are hard or impossible to pr privatize because of the mobility and the dynamic of, of the resource, such as open ocean fisheries or very big pasture lands, things like groundwater, and of course also the air and the climate. Another thing is that sometimes one can just achieve more collectively than alone. So collectively we can find ways to use resources more efficiently or to find innovative ways to use resources and if we just privatize everything everybody for themselves we are not able to make use of these these benefits of finding solutions together so in fact let's think about why Harbin Hardin thought that these would be the only solutions top-down regulation or privatization well Hardin's thinking reflects some of the assumptions people had for a long time in evolutionary biology and in economics so in evolutionary biology it was thought that ultimately evolution is about competition so that more selfish individuals should do better in the long term outcompeting the modest or prosocial individuals and also in economics, it was thought that human behavior is ultimately about rational, self-interested decision-making. That's kind of how humans are like. So humans will always do what is best for themselves individually in the short term. That's just how humans make decisions. But this thinking started to create a number of puzzles. So first of all, if we look in biology, in fact, many social species seem to have overcome the tragedy of the commons. Many social species, again, also are such that they de are dealing with social interactions uh, and many social dilemmas. So we can see how do they, in, in the course of evolutionary history, how have they solved these social bi dilemmas through different kinds of social behaviors, for example. In fact, evolution, we now know, is not always just about survival of the fittest individual, but sometimes also about survival of the most cooperative group. And so in this way, mechanisms of cooperation exist across biology, and we can explore these to better understand what are some principles and mechanisms that allow these groups to persist for a very long time and not be kind of uh, overrun by the tragedy of the comments. Even we can look at our own body as such a hyper-cooperative group of billions and trillions of cells. How does it fit together? How does not, for example, cancer spread constantly in everybody's uh, body? And of course, isn't also cooperation pervading our everyday lives and our societies? How do we do it? How come uh, if we are constantly dealing with social interactions and the potential of social dilemmas and yet many times in our everyday experience we're not dealing with the tragedy of the commons but are able to pull ourselves together and cooperate and achieve something together so how do we actually do it indeed the tragedy of the commons scenario that Gar garrett hardin was looking at it actually only happens under certain conditions and in reality these conditions are often different for example Communities of humans often have a common history and a common future, and the group members know that. They know that their fates are intertwined, that they need and want to live together harmoniously in the future, so they have certain goals and values that go beyond just material interests, and they're also aware that their behavior may be punished by others in the future, even if only symbolically by, by talking and so on. So this will affect their motivations. And human members of a community also communicate a lot with, with each other and they learn from each other. There's a lot of talk about the behavior of the members, about the past and the future, about each other's intentions, such that trust and transparency can emerge. And this again will impact how humans might behave in, in such situations of social dilemmas. And communities often also depend on a resource for their survival and they know it so they will sooner or later volunteer time and effort to set up rules for their sustainable use before it's too late. So humans are not just these myopic robots that will just use it all up, uh, even though there are, of course, examples like this in history. But 
many times communities, they can volunteer time knowing that it's necessary in order to solve their challenges. Now we can think about how are today's sustainability problems may be different from these conditions. That is something that we can also think about to kind of understand why might today's sustainability challenges be especially challenging for us to solve. So to really understand how to solve the tragedy of the commons that goes beyond these simple um, ideas that Harvin proposed, um, this is something that the diversity of researchers have looked at since the 1970s. They really started to take a closer look at human behavior in situations of common resource use and other social interactions to really understand, well, what is it that humans actually do? How do they make, think and make decisions and react to each other? And this is how the field of behavioral economics and behavioral sciences in general was kind of reborn uh, in some way. And here are just some of the important scientists in the field. We want to look at a particular one, which is Eleanor Ostrom, because she really was very central in helping us better understand the situation of the commons. So Eleanor Ostrom, she, what she did, she studied many diverse common pool resource situations in the world, like fisheries, um, irrigation systems, pastures, forests. And she found, contrary to Hardin, that humans do and can cooperate around shared resources in order to use them sustainably, but only under certain conditions. And these are known as Ostrom's core design principles. In, she, in fact, she was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics for her work in 2009 because she really kind of uh, very much revolutionized the way that we now think about uh, ways to solve the tragedy of the commons that are very different from how economists thought about it during Garrett Hardin's times. So here is the list of the eight core design principles of Eleanor Ostrom. Um, we can think of them really as social conditions that help avoid or reduce the dilemma in cooperation. These are also really ways that successful human groups tend to organize themselves. And we can think of them as social conditions that help promote human prosocial motivations and, and make more self-interested behaviors less, less necessary. And they also help fulfill certain human psychological needs. Like the first principle we can think about is a lot about the need of having a sense of belonging and, and shared identity with other people. And then there's also several of those principles that help fulfill our need for autonomy. So contrary to what Hardin said, freedom brings ruin and, and uh, therefore we should restrict freedom. Well, it's not so simple because ultimately humans do have a strong sense of autonomy and we have to honor this if we want to achieve also not just ecological but social sustainability. And humans also have needs such as the need for competency. And so we need to find ways that, for example, if humans are behaving in a way that is helpful, to give them good feedback and so on. And so these principles are very general. They don't really prescribe for a particular group what to do in their context. And so there are many different ways to implement these principles. For example, if we have the principle inclusive decision making, fair and inclusive decision making, there's many different ways to do this. We can have kind of anonymous votes if it's a very large group, or we can have like discussion rounds where everybody can voice their opinion if it's a smaller group and so on. So there's many different ways that we can implement these principles. And the uh, approach of pro-social is about generalizing these principles, not just so not just using them for groups that have to share limited natural resources, but really we can use them to improve how any group works together, including in schools and classrooms, but also government agencies, businesses, organizations, and so on. So we can use those principles to help us better work together towards shared goals. And so in this group work, we want you to explore the design principles for cooperation a little bit more and also then identify ways how your project group 
um, can make sure to implement these principles well. Thank you.